Hello and welcome to this live faith TV live stream. This is session 12 of the unveiling of Jesus Christ, the completion of God's counsels concerning heaven and earth. That should say session 12 there. It's analyzing the spiritual conflict in chapter 12. So I'm Richard. Thank you for joining me today. We've been in 11 sessions already of this unveiling, and we're getting to the reason for the judgments today. We're going to look at chapter 12 and see the reason for the judgments. I've got a PowerPoint presentation here for you. You can download. It's The uh, links are in the video description. And if you download all those and print them out, you'll have quite a book on the book of Revelation that you can go through on the unveiling here. I call it the book of Revelation and the unveiling interchangeably because the words mean the same thing. The word unveiling means uh, revealing, uh, you know, a revelation of Jesus Christ. It's the actual revealing of Christ to the earth, the unveiling. He's hidden now. He's going to be made known. So we've been through the first 11 chapters. And in this 12th session, I'll introduce the section in the unveiling from chapters 12 through 15, by reading chapter 12, then we'll dig into it in more detail. On Wednesday evening, we'll look at the beginning of Satan's conflict with mankind by examining the fall of man in more detail. That's Wednesday night. I think we have to have it as part of this because it's the trigger of everything that's going on today. And once we understand that trigger, we'll understand the unveiling much better. So chapters 12 through 15 are a section. And they use a literary device called a historologia, which means something written later that occurred earlier. So what is described in chapter 12 through 15 takes place before the sixth chapter. Good morning, St. Louis. Louis? <laughs> Never know how to say that. Anyway, what's described takes in chapters 12 through 15 takes place before the sixth chapter. Before the seven seals are opened, it starts there. And then it leads up to and runs parallel with chapters 6 through 11, which we've already covered. And those are, of course, the seals and the trumpets. So the opening of the seven seals was in that section, covering the whole period of the day of the Lord up to the Lord's return. The sealing of the 144,000 of Israelites before anything is touched at all. The vision of the great multitude that will come uh, to God out of the judgments the seven trumpets and the measuring of the temple area, etc., is all in the sections we've covered. So what we're going to cover today in chapter 12 starts before uh, that sixth chapter. In fact, it goes all the way back to the beginning. And then it takes us all the way through to this, the, uh, right before the seven uh, vials or bowls of God's wrath. So chapters 6 through 11, then, that the information I just told you that's in there, that section, are exoteric. That means they provide the outer view. Chapters 12 through 15 show the esoteric or the inner view of the same period. This section gives the reason for the judgments to proceed from the throne to the inhabitants of the earth. Why is God doing all these judgments? They're pretty horrific. And... Some people can't understand it. So he's given the reason for it here. It, it reveals the spiritual conflict of the eons. That's what, what we're going to be talking about. So it is not chronological, 12 through 15. It's not chronological, but episodal and parenthetical. So let's read chapter 12 of the unveiling. And a great sign was seen in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and on her head a wreath of twelve stars. And being pregnant, she is crying, travailing and tormenting to be bringing forth. We have a pregnant woman here in space. <laughs> and I saw another sign in heaven, and lo, a great fiery red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and on its head seven diadems. And boy, has this confused people. And its tail is dragging a third of the stars of heaven and casts them into the earth. And the dragon stands before the woman who is about to be bringing forth that it may be devouring her child whenever she may be bringing forth. 
And she brought forth a man child, a son, a male, who was about to be shepherding all the nations with a rod, iron club. And her child is snatched away to God and to his throne. Verse 6, and the woman fled into the wilderness there where she has a place made ready by God that they may be nourishing her for 1,260 days. And a battle occurred in heaven. Michael and his messengers battle with the dragon, and the dragon battles and his messengers. And they are not strong enough for him, neither was their place still found in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that ancient serpent called the adversary and Satan, who is deceiving the whole inhabited earth. It was cast out into the earth, and its messengers were cast with it. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now, just now, just now comes the salvation and power in the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren was cast out, who was, cast, who was accusing them before our God day and night. And they conquer him through the blood of the lambkin and through the word of their testimony, and they love not their soul unto death. Verse 12, therefore make merry, ye heavens, and those tabernacling in them. Woe to the land and the sea, for the adversary descending to you has great fury, being aware that brief is the season that he has. And when the dragon perceived that it was cast into the earth, it persecutes the woman who brought forth the man-child. And given to the woman were two wings of a large vulture, or eagle, that she may be flying into the wilderness, into her place, that where she is nourished for a season and seasons and half a season from the face of the serpent. And the serpent cast water as a river out of its mouth after the woman, that she should be carried away by its current. And the earth helps the woman, and the earth opens its mouth and swallowed the river, which the dragon casts out of his mouth. And the dragon is angry with the woman and came away to do battle with the rest of her seed, who are keeping the precepts of God and who have who have the testimony of Jesus. That's the entirety of the, the 12th chapter. Now we're going to go through it in a little more detail. It's pregnant with truth, just like this woman is pregnant in verse 1. So we started with verse 1 of chapter 12, a great sign. This is a great sign, not a little sign. It has great significance, so we have to take note of it. It's a great sign, and this is the first sign in the book of Revelation, or the unveiling. It isn't a book of signs, it's a book of symbols. But those symbols are interpreted by the written word in most cases. The sign, great sign was in heaven. This is a great sign of great significance. And it is a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and on her head a wreath of 12 stars. What could this be meaning? She being pregnant, crying, travailing and tormenting to bring forth. She's in pregnant just about to deliver. So the woman has been said to be many things, including the church, Mother Mary, and Mary Eddie Baker. Believe it or not, Christian science says that this great woman is Mary Eddie Baker, and the moon under her feet are the followers who accept her doctrine of Christian science, and the, uh, the ones that come after her later to persecute her are those who reject Christian science. See how far off the word people get and still claim to believe it? You can believe your interpretation of the word. That doesn't mean that it's the word. It doesn't mean you're believing God's word. You're just believing your idea of what it means. But we have to believe what God says. And this, we have an indication in the Bible itself of who this woman is, what this woman is. It's in Genesis 37, verses 9 and 10. And he, Joseph, dreamed yet another dream and told it to his brethren and said, Behold, I have dreamed a dream more. And behold, the sun and the moon and the 11 stars made obscience to me. And he told it to his father, Abraham, and to his brethren, Reuben and all the rest. And his father rebuked him and said unto him, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall I and thy mother... Uh, and, thy, and it's Rachel, and thy brethren indeed come to bow down ourselves to thee, to the earth. So Abraham, you see, recognized the symbology. He knew what the symbology meant, that the, the, uh, the sun and the moon 
were him and uh, Rachel. And then uh, the 12 stars, the 11 stars would be the 11 tribes, the 12th being Joseph. So we have a picture of Israel in embryo, Israel in embryo here in this vision. There may have been a conjunction of constellations, which they call the Star of Bethlehem, the one that the wise men saw, remember? They were actually astro astronomers, not wise men, but astronomers. They, uh, they saw this star in Bethlehem, you remember? And uh, they went right to uh, Bethlehem. It took them a couple of years to do that trek. And, and, but um, how did they know about this? Well, Daniel was in Persia. Daniel was in Persia, remember? We've been through Daniel, and he taught them. He was a wise man, a prophet. He taught them the word in the stars and what the stars were for, which go back to Genesis, says they're for signs and for seasons. They're to mark signs and seasons. So this is one great sign, as it says in the first one. It's a constellation. And people have done research on this, and I didn't have time to look it up, but if you go to YouTube and you look up the Star of Bethlehem, you'll find one by a, a gentleman who, an astronomer, who went back and saw this constellation in uh, uh, by computer, you know, turning the heaven, the heavens back, these, uh, what do you call it, the route of the stars, the route the stars and the, the planets take. He used a computer to go all the way back and found one at 3 BC. This conjunction of the woman, which would be Virgo, and the moon under her feet. So you have the Virgo constellation with the moon under it, the star shining on it. And uh, that's the constellation. So uh, the 12 stars, of course, are the 12 signs of the zodiac. The, the 12 constellations of the zodiac. Each constellation is made up of three. And I'm going to read here from Bullinger, a commentary on Revelation about this, this uh, sign here. Just briefly, let me find it. So he says, this at once takes us back to Genesis uh, 37, which we just read. The only scripture in the whole Bible where we've seen anything corresponding to this sign. So it's about uh, Israel. So <clears throat> the heathen nations, being ignorant of the written word of God, did not know the primitive truths preserved by the antediluvian patriarchs, that's the patriarchs before the flood, in the signs and constellations of the heavens before it was written down by God through Moses in the scriptures of truth. So what he's saying is before Moses wrote the scripture in the wrote the scriptures, God had already documented everything he's going to do for Israel in the stars. It's a document. That's what the heavens are, a document of God's will <clears throat> concerning uh, the earth. So Romans 1, 20 and 21 declares that they, the heathen, were without excuse for the invisible things of God were clearly seen and understood by the things that are made. The heavens declared his glory and spoke of his purposes. That's what Romans 1, 19 through 23 refers to. The patriarchs had long before the times of Jacob and Joseph so mapped out the heavens as to preserve the great foundation, promise, and prophecy of Genesis 3, 15 by making arbitrary configurations of the stars. That this is no mere conjecture is shown by the important article in the 19th century magazine, uh, that's the name of the magazine, the 19th Century Magazine, printed in September 1900 by E.W. Maunder of the Greenwich Observatory, the oldest picture book of all, is what he called it. He says there are some indications which seem to have escaped notice hitherto by which we may fix, roughly at least, the date of certain other constellations and those of the extreme south. These are the 12 commonly known as the signs of the zodiac, which beyond all controversy were planned in order to mark out the ecliptic. The division of the zodiac into 12 signs is one very great significance. Now, this perhaps was the most difficult discovery which up to the present day has yet been made in astronomy. 
the interdependence of so many of the designs and the fact that the sphere is thus manifestly the work of a single authority furnish reasons for thinking that it was intended to be of the nature of a document. An examination of the individual forms support this conclusion. Again, he says, we are sure that the Zodiac is not later than 1800 B.C. and does not date further back than 4400 B.C. He sums up the article by saying that this oldest picture book of all was designed nearly 5,000 years ago and that many of the constellations then were mapped out to, the expre to express the religious belief of their designers. No doubt the others, of which at present we have no explanation, had just the same purpose. Mr. Miranda also said that the religion of those who designed the zodiac and mapped out the constellations involved the erection of altars and the rite of sacrifice. They were acquainted with the stories of the fall and the deluge, sub, sub, substantially the same as those preserved to us in the early chapters of Genesis, and they devised many of the constellations to give appropriate and permanent record of them. So that's from man's point of view. But in Psalms, it tells us that uh, the word of God is written in the stars. Uh, for some 2,000 years before Moses, the heavens declared the glory of God and not only showed his handiwork, but from day to day uttered speech and from night to night showed knowledge. That's what that psalm says. <clears throat> True, there was no speech nor language. Their voice was not heard, and yet their line, their inheritance or their sphere of teaching is gone out through the, all the earth and their words to the end of the world. In them, in the heavens, hath he set a tabernacle or dwelling for the sun. That's the path of the sun through the signs of the zodiac, but goes forth from one end of the heaven to the other, performing his annual circuit. So see the whole of Psalm 19. But these words and this knowledge, after they were written down in scripture, naturally fell into disuse and in time were forgotten. And afterwards, they were overlaid by the traditions of man. If Moses wrote by the time of the Exodus, this would give us about 9, 1491 B.C. for the date of the books of the Pentateuch, from then, and thus leave mankind some 2,500 years without the written word of God. Thus, for all that long period, the heavens would be showing their knowledge and sending forth their words to the end of the earth and preserving the great primeval promise and prophecy of Genesis 3.15 about the seed of the woman, if you're familiar with that one. He would keep that prophecy alive in the hearts of God's people in, and uh, making known the coming one who, through the bruised, bruised, though bruised in the heels, should finally crush the serpent's head. These 12 stars, therefore, were zodiacal signs which were thus associated with Israel in the persons of Jacob and the 12 patriarchs. These constituted and represented the whole nation in embryo. Their presence here in Revelation 12 tells us that God is about to reveal his own truth, write folly on all the devices of the heathen, expose their false use of his own handiwork, the stars, and as he smote the gods of Egypt when he delivered Israel from thence, so then when he again he is about to deliver Israel. He will execute his judgment on the gods of the heathen by showing that their perversions of his primal promise will not affect its fulfillment but all their mythology and their mytho mythological gods shall be helpless and useless to deliver them out of his hand. So we're not talking about astrology here. We're actually talking about astronomy. God put the stars there for signs, it says in Genesis. In that psalm, it says that it speaks to us. So you have 12 signs, starting with Virgo, the virgin, who's going to bring forth the man-child. Each, each uh, sign, each of the 12 signs, has three constellations. They were named not by men, but by God, it says in the Old Testament and in the Psalms, that God named all the stars. And the pictures were drawn around to symbolize what the names of the stars meant, so they could remember the names of the stars. Because you can take the stars and draw any picture you want by connecting dots. How did they come up with the 12 Vir Virgo all the way through Leo? Because the names of the stars in each of those constellations tells what the story is about. In Virgo, you have stars named the branch, uh, uh, the child. There's different stars named that associate Virgo with the birth of the man-child. 
by the virgin. And the last sign is Leo, and Jesus Christ comes back as the lion of the tribe of Judah. Leo is the lion. So you have 12 pictures of God's plan centered in Jesus Christ for the earth. But the only thing not in the stars is what? Can you guess? The secrets revealed to Paul. You will not find those in the stars. Now, nobody reads the stars anymore because, as Bollinger said, we have the written word. So this knowledge has fallen into disuse. It was corrupted first by the worship of the stars by the Egyptians, the Assyrians, the Egyptians, Babylonians. But then it turned into, uh, it was corrupted further into a, uh, astrology, which made the stars about you, not about Christ. Isn't that a perversion? So the stars have nothing to do with you as far as we know, but they have to do with our Lord Jesus Christ from his birth all the way through the zodiac, around the ecleptic, to Leo the lion. So that's interesting, isn't it? So this thing we're reading, and this about this great sign of the woman, appeared as a constellation in 3 B.C., to announce the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ. So, uh, Joseph is the 12th star. The 12 tribes of Israel are represented. By the way, the ensigns, or the signs of each tribe, they had a, a raise a flag, an ensign for each tribe. Those were the 12 signs of the zodiac, believe it or not. Not, not astro astrology, we're talking about God's purpose for the stars. So, the woman... Uh, Joseph's the 12th star, the 12 tribes of Israel represented. The moon represents the dim light of spiritual darkness in the word of God. And that's why the lunar calendar is used in the book of the unveiling instead of the, uh, uh, the normal calendar. So Israel used both calendars because of their, uh, uh, their feast days corresponding with harvest dates and planting and harvesting. So they used uh, a lunar calendar for that part, but they, they added a month, uh, an extra month every few years to compensate for the difference between 360-day year, which is a lunar year, and a 365 and a quarter day year, which is the normal calendar. So anyway, the woman is in birth pangs in this vision, ready to give birth. This sets the stage for the adversary to react. In 12.3 of unveiling, there was seen another sign in heaven, lo, a great fiery red dragon having seven heads, ten horns, and on his heads, seven diadems. Remember that this sign is seen in heaven, not on earth. The word great is associated with the sign as well as the first. It's the great dragon. The fiery red dragon is red because it is murderous, and it violently opposes all God says and does, violently opposes adversary to God's people. To God and his people. A dragon is a beast. Both terms are figurative. The dragon is figurative. The beast is figurative. Literally, this uh, entity, which is never named, by the way, in God's word. He doesn't deserve a name. <laughs> so, but uh, dragon is figurative for his murderous, uh, his, his fierceness his, and being murderous. And a uh, beast is used in the same way. The dragon is a beast. The dragon has seven heads and ten horns, and on its heads are diadems or crowns, indicating spiritual authority, since this vision is in heaven. So these have to do with the spiritual realm, not the physical realm. The ten horns connect this vision with the visions and revelations in Daniel concerning the same period of time. The earthly is a pattern of the heavenly. We'll get into this well, a little later, I don't want to dig too deep into the seven heads and the ten horns at this time. Unveiling 12.4a, and its tail is dragging, this dragon's tail is dragging a third of the stars of heaven and casts them into the earth. Now, stars in unveiling uh, are symbolic of God's messengers. The dragon drags a third of the messengers, not always, but you can tell the difference when it's used of God's messengers, like here a third of the stars of heaven cast of the earth would destroy it. So we have to have a figure of speech here. If it's not true to fact, that's the measure. 
if it's not true to fact, then it's a figure of speech, and you look to see what it's what it's trying to convey, the truth in the figure. So the stars of heaven here are messengers. The dragon drags a third of the messengers or angels of heaven and casts them to the earth. Uh, messengers is the actual translation of an angelos, angelos, which uh, they translate angels is actually a transliteration of angelos in the Greek. And that, a transliteration just means you take the Greek word and put it, write it in English letters in the same way. But a translation takes and uh, converts the word to the new language you're translating to. The translation of angelos is messenger. The transliteration is angels. So don't get confused by that. They mean the same thing. The dragon drags a third of the messengers of heaven and casts them to the earth. This cannot be the war in heaven referred to just verses later in this same chapter. This had to happen before that. This event occurred long in the past, at least before the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It probably occurred during the first eon in the period of the first earth, but it may have occurred during Jesus' ministry where he said, I beheld Satan as lightning falling from heaven. He wasn't kicked out of heaven there. It's Satan himself falling to the earth because Jesus says this when the 70 return and uh, from their mission, their evangelism, their evangelistic mission with joy, explaining that the demons were subject to them. So in the context of them having power over the demons, uh, Jesus says, I beheld Satan as lightning falling from heaven, which uh, signifies the loss of authority by uh, Satan. The dragon deceived a third of the angelic realm to join him in his opposition to the God of creation. That's what this means, dragging a third of the stars of heaven to the earth. Verse 4b and 5, and the dragon stands before the woman. That's in present tense. So he's been standing there ever since he dragged a third of the stars down before the woman's birth, uh, before the woman gave birth. The dragon stands before the woman who is about to be bringing forth that it may be devouring her child whenever she may be bringing forth. So he took a stand to destroy this woman's child when it would be born. How did he know about this woman's child? Well, that goes back to Genesis 3.15, the promise of the coming Messiah, the promised seed, the primal prophecy. We'll read that a little later. So the dragon is standing before Israel that's pregnant, you know, pr by promise, waiting to give birth, devouring her child whenever she may be bringing forth. He's there waiting. And she brought forth a son, a male, who is about to be shepherding all the nations with an iron club. Who could that be? Well, you know, when it says with an iron club, that and Israel brought forth a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the only person this can be referring to. And her child is snatched away to God and to his throne. What a great verse. This is the whole career of Jesus on earth. She, he's born and then he's snatched away. It skips his entire ministry because it's not relevant at this point. Uh, what's uh, uh, relevant here is that the dragon's going after this male child as soon as it's born. But God snatches him. And, and he thought he had him when he cru had him crucified. Uh, but he was surprised when God snatched him away to his throne. That's the ascension. That word snatched away, by the way, is the same word, harpazo, that's used in 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18, where it says we will be snatched, the church will be snatched away to meet the Lord in the air. Isn't that a great word? Snatched, just taken off the earth. But this is not, a, this includes the, uh, the, uh, the resurrection and ascension, I suppose. Because he goes all the way to God in his throne. It has to include the ascension. So the devil waits in anticipation for the woman's child to be born with the intent to destroy him any way he can. The woman births a son, a male, who will shepherd the nations with an iron club. This can be none other than Jesus Christ, our Lord. She gives birth and her child is snatched away to God and to his throne. Jesus' earthly ministry is completely bypassed. Only his birth and ascension above the heavens is described. Verse 6, and the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place made ready by God, and there they may be nourishing her 1,260 days. That's three and a half years, 42 months on a lunar calendar. 
Having failed to prevent the birth of the man-child, the dragon goes after the woman, Israel, intending to completely wipe out God's chosen people. This activity corresponds to the three-and-a-half-year mark in the last week of Daniel's 77s. The beast shows its true colors by breaking the seven-year covenant of Israel with Israel and placing the abomination of desolation on a wing or pinnacle of the rebuilt temple in Jerusalem. We've talked about that already. Great persecution is unleashed against the saints of Israel and the Gentiles who believe. This is when the image of the beast is made and the mark of the beast is initiated. Israel flees into the wilderness toward the north to escape the onslaught against them in Jerusalem. We have a lot of songs and people claiming that they're going to run to Petra. Well, Petra is south. It's not north. They run into a wilderness north. They're furnished there in the wilderness for 1,260 days, which is 42 months, which is three and a half lunar years. This is the last half of Daniel's 70, 70th week. So remember, this is the second exodus this is talking about, because the first exodus, God took him out into the wilderness, remember? He's going to do that again. He nourished them in the wilderness with manna from heaven. And that's what he's going to do again. He's going to make sure he, they are nourished. Well, he puts them in a place where it says they feed him. So it might not be manna from heaven, but the manna was put in the Ark of the Covenant uh, as a permanent witness that God will supply his people's needs. And it, it's referring, it was done in reference to the end times. So God gave him a promise way back that he would take care of them when this happens. And he will. So the, the ugly truth about all this is that when the, uh, the beast invades Israel at this three and a half year mark, two thirds of Israel is going to die, according to Zechariah. Two thirds, only one third is going to uh, heed Jesus' warning to flee and go and get out of the city and be saved. Terrible destruction. Unveiling 12, 7 through 9, and a battle then occurs in heaven. Michael and his messengers battle with the dragon, and the dragon battles and his messengers. So we see Michael instituting the war here, not the dragon. Michael starts this war, and they are not strong enough for him, the dragon and his messengers. They're not strong enough for him, neither was their place still found in heaven. And that great dragon was cast out, that ancient serpent, called adversary and Satan, who was deceiving the whole inhabited earth, it was cast into the earth and its messengers were cast out with it. This is still future. This is spoken of as it was in the far past. This, this is the spiritual battle most theologians claim happened in the far past. They confuse this with the dragon dragging a third of the stars of heaven to the earth, which was in the old Old, olden times. That event happened in the long past, but this war is timed with the outcasting of Satan himself from heaven, which did not occur when the dragon dragged a third of the messengers to the earth. So this is different. This is when God declares war through Michael, uses Michael to take the dragon and his messengers out of the celestial sphere. They're forced down to the earth so again, Michael instigates this war with the dragon, not the dragon. It's an offensive war for God, not defensive. God is taking back control of the earth. The time has come to confine the dragon to the earthly realm. Before this, he had access to the throne of God to accuse the saints, and that's referring to Israel, not the church, day and night. Verse 9 of Unveiling 12, the great dragon was cast out. That ancient serpent calls him great because of the magnitude of his evil. The great dragon was cast out. That ancient serpent, remember the Garden of Eden? The ancient serpent called adversary, that's Diabolos, devil, which means slanderer, and Satan, which means uh, adversary. So he's a slanderer and an adversary who is deceiving the whole inhabited earth. Satan's not a title, by the way. I mean, it's a title. It's not a, a name. It's not a proper noun. It's a title. It means adversary. And Diabolos, devil. There's many de devils, it says, but there's only one 
that opposes uh, at the top, one adversary at the top, who is deceiving the whole inhabited earth. It was cast into the earth and his messengers were cast with it. Four titles of the dragon are listed here, following, followed by the purpose of all his activities. The great dragon is the first title and indicates his ferocity, his murderous character, and his power to inflict evil. The ancient serpent, he's called, it takes us back to Genesis and the temptation of Eve, standing against God's purposes and God's people. The adversary is the one who stands against God to destroy the works of God. And Satan means adversary. Uh, this word, adversary, devil, is actually slanderer. So this is a slanderer and an adversary. Purpose, he deceives the whole earth, which strikes at the heart of God who loves his creature. He gives him these four aspects, and what his purpose is, is to deceive the whole earth. Revelation 12, 10. And I hear a loud voice in heaven saying, just now came the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren was cast out, who was accusing them before our God day and night. So the casting out of Satan and his messengers is celebrated in heaven with a loud voice. We're not told who speaks, but it could be the whole host of heaven. The way it was uh, paved at that time, the way was paved at that time for the establishment of Christ's kingdom on earth through his authority to rule the nations because the devil's authority was just thrown down. But this is yet to be worked out on the earth. So it's, it's a cry of anticipation, a, a praise of anticipation. The Satan accused our brethren, the Satan, the adversary, accused our brethren, undeniably Israel, not the Gentiles, day and night before our God. In the epistles that Paul wrote, God is our father. Huh, isn't that something? Not our God. He's our father. No one can bring an accusation or charge against those in the church. According to Romans 8, I think around 22, and well, it's later than that. <clears throat> but in Romans chapter 8, it says, who will lay a charge against God's elect, which we are, the church of, of uh, God, the body of Christ. So this is not talking about us, it's talking about Israel. Unveiling 12.11, and they conquer him, the devil, the dragon, that old serpent, through the blood of the lambkin, and through the word of their testimony, they love not their soul unto death. So there's some works involved here. They, the believers out of Israel, that is talking about conquered Satan through one, the blood of the lambkin, and two, the word of their testimony works. They did not crumble and fall under heavy persecution, but stood strong even to death, giving glory to God. So this is faith and works. But the church, the body of Christ, conquered Satan through the blood of the lambkin alone. Alone. Theirs was through also through the word of their testimony, works, and their martyrdom, not loving their soul to death. But how well prepared are you to stand regardless of a sword poised to cut off your head? Have you thought about that? What would you do? We are involved in the conflict of the eons, the spiritual battle taking place in the realm of the air and on the earth. But God is not at war, as is commonly thought. He's far above all and is in total control of all. So have faith. God is not at war. This is not a big spiritual war between God and Satan. That's a joke. Satan is no match for God. It's no war at all. It takes one lone angel to tie this guy up, Satan, uh, the adversary, and throw him in chains for a thousand years. So don't get carried away by that, uh, where the devil is God's equal and they're fighting it out and somehow God's going to win. Don't worry. He's going to win. But he has a, uh, you know, his foe is nothing to him. <clears throat> He created the devil for a purpose. <clears throat> Excuse me, Valiant 12, 12. Therefore, make merry, ye heavens, and those tabernacling in them. Woe to the land and the sea, for the adversary descended to you, having great fury, being aware that brief is the season he has. And that brief time is three and a half years from this point. So we know this is in the future, this, cat, this war in heaven. The news that Satan is cast out of heaven causes great rejoicing among the celestial host, yet forecasts great woe for those on earth. This is the third woe 
that we saw announced uh, at, uh, in the seventh trumpet, three, uh, actually between the fifth and the sixth trumpets. He said there's three woes yet to come. And the, 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 the fifth trumpet was the first one. That was the locusts, the spiritual locusts, spiritual beings that torment those who don't have the seal of God for five months. And the second woe, and which means destruction, by the way, the word woe, the second destruction or woe was the 200 million spiritual horsemen released from the pit that go and torture those who don't have the seal of God on their forehead and kill them. And then this is the third woe, and it's going to comprise all of the last seven vials. We're not there yet, but it will compose this third woe will. But we're at the third woe being announced here. Having been cast out of heaven, the devil realizes his time is short. Only three and a half years left to succeed in defeating God and his son. And he is filled with fury. So he goes after the remnant of the seed of Jacob, Israel, and those of the Gentiles who believe. He can't do anything with Christ, so he goes after the seed of Jacob. He's driven to do this because of his nature. Somebody asked me why he, he, he can read the book. He knows he fails. Why does he keep going after God and God's people? And that's because he's driven to because of his nature. Hey, Kevin, how you doing, Mr. Bartley? Unveiling 12, 13, and 14. When the dragon perceived that it was cast into the earth, it persecutes the woman who brought forth the male. And given to the woman were two wings of a large vulture or eagle. You know, a vulture is an eagle. An eagle is a vulture. That she may be flying into the wilderness into her place. I mean, not all vultures are eagles. That's just one, one uh, strain. Is, but uh, eagles are definitely vultures. So you'll see in King James, it's tra translated eagle. And that has caused people to think that the U.S. is going to fly in to save Israel. Well, the U.S. was not around when God delivered Egypt, and he said he led them out on the wings of an eagle or a, a vulture. So it's just talking about the speed with which uh, the woman escapes into the wilderness. The speed, God's going to help them get there quickly, that she may be flying into the wilderness into her place, that where there where she is nourished for a season and seasons and half a season. That terminology is the same in Daniel as time, times, and half a time. It talks about each one's a year. A year and years, two years makes three, and a half a year makes three and a half years, which we are already told that's what that means from the face of the serpent. So God... Uh, helps them get to the wilderness. Like I said, only a third of Israel is going to heed and be saved. The greatest persecution of all time then erupts against Israel, the woman who brought forth the male. The seven-year covenant is broken at this point, marking the three-and-a-half-year period spoken by Daniel the prophet, and the woman escapes into the wilderness to a place prepared in advance by God to sustain them. This is the second Egyptian deliverance, which is much larger in scope than the first exodus. Verses 15 through 17, the serpent casts water as a river out of its mouth after the woman, that she should be carried away by its current. And the earth helps the woman, and the earth opens its mouth and swallowed the river, and the dragon casts out of his mouth, which the dragon casts out of his mouth. And the dragon is angry with the woman, and came away to do battle with the rest of her seed who are not keeping the precepts, who are keeping the precepts of God and who have the testimony of Jesus. That's who he goes after. He doesn't care about the ones that aren't standing for God. They're already uh, sidelined. So he goes after the ones who are. In the first exodus, God split the waters of the Nile River to allow passage of the Israelites into the wilderness. And then he brought the water down upon the Egyptians, remember? And they, they died and Israel was saved. Here, the serpent casts water as a river out of its mouth to drown those escaping Jerusalem. But they receive help from God. The ground swallowed the river. Now, people have a hard time believing this, but the casting out of the mouth is obviously figurative language. It will be a very real river, a torrent of water. Satan is the prince and power of the air, so he can summon water, summons water right out of the air to accomplish his dirty deed, but God defeats him. So Satan has power over that. Delegated to him, but he has it. The 12th chapter of the unveiling shows us the spiritual battle being waged for the dominion of the earth and the salvation of mankind.
To understand this better, to receive the full impact of this section of scripture, one must to have a full understanding of the spiritual conflict being described. So I'm going to give you a short, compacted history of the adversary. The adversary is not actually God's adversary, to think about it, but man's. He can only do what God allows him to do. God uses him to thwart man. So let's start with the origin of an early history of this creature called the devil and Satan. And I found this. There might be better, but I'm going to read this. Um, To you, I'm going to get it, and the link is in the video description. Of course, so let's see if I can share this screen. Hold on, okay, I'll stop sharing that, and I'm going to share another screen. Which is going to be, hold on a second. I got to get the window over to the other one. Don't you love technology? Hey, if we didn't have it, we couldn't do this, right? There we go. Okay, now I'm going to share it with you. If I can here. There we go. That's going to be small. I'll try to get it bigger here for you. Control plus plus plus. Whoops. Maybe I should just read it. I'm trying to make it bigger here for us. There we go. Okay, so now they want to offer me a free newsletter, which I can no longer get. There we go. Doggone. I have to shrink it again. <laughs> Watch what you hit with these buttons, they say. Okay. There we go. All right. Let me shrink this down a little bit. Okay. This is still in the way, this one, doggone. I can't get rid of it. So I'm gonna just reload it. Hold on, I'm, I'm still. So I'm, I've got the link in there. I'm just going to read it. Let's see. The Hebrew word say. Give it a second, and I'll share again. Where is...
There we go. There we go. Try it once more here. Thank you for your patience. There we go. Satan, the Hebrew word Satan, means an adversary, one who resists. It's translated as Satan 18 times in the Old Testament, 14 of these occurrences being in Job 1 and 2, a big section there, others in 1 Chronicles 21.1 and Zechariah 3, 1 and 2. There's some dispute as to whether it should be taken as a proper name or a title. In Job and Zechariah, the definite article precedes the noun, the Satan or the accuser. This, some argue, it should be a title, while in First Chronicles, there's no article, it should be a proper name. The words used also of various persons in the Old Testament as adversaries. It's just a title, in including David is called it, Rezin of Damascus, the angel of the Lord, and the references are here in this article. In the Old Testament, then, Satan is not an evil principle opposing God. In Job, the Satan is not God's adversary, but Job's. He acts as one of God's subordinates, courtiers, to follow his directives. This view is premised on the idea that there is a difference in this being while he is still in heaven rather than being cast out and being assigned to the realm of the earth. He does not seem at this point to be an adversary of all humans, but rather of selected people. In Zechariah 3.1, he is a potential accuser. In 1 Chronicles 21, the one inciting David to evil. Within the Job narrative, Satan acts at God's directive. While in 1.12 and 2, 6 through 7 of Job point to Satan's casual role in Job's life, later texts like chapter 6, verse 4, 7, 14, 9, 17 appear to lay blame on God. Thus, Satan carries out divine directives. That's what people don't understand. They think he's on the loose on his own, doing whatever he wants. And God's running after him to clean up the devil's mess. Hi, D. Glad to see you, Joshua. God bless you all. So, yeah, the devil, this being, is real. He's a spiritual ring. He was created for the purposes of God. He was created the exact opposite nature of God, so God would have an adversary through which he could reveal his light. There has to be darkness to reveal light. People are in darkness due to the adversary. So, and Wednesday night, we're going to really see why, what, how that came about. So, it's not Job's piety, but the connection between his piety and his prosperity was what Satan questioned. This is one of the wisdom themes in the Old Testament. He implied that Job's piety, his love for God, was based on self-interest. The tests that followed were meant to demonstrate what that relation was. Satan occurs 36 times in the New Testament, 18 of that number in the Gospels and Acts. By the way, God uh, does this not to reveal to him how we were, respond to, to the things he sets up. It was It's to reveal it to ourselves. So we can realize we need him and go to him for deliverance. So 18, uh, Satan occurs 36 times in the New Testament, 18 of that number in the Gospels and Acts. The Greek term Satanus is a loan word from the Hebrew Old Testament. It's Satan in Hebrew, it's Satana or Satanas in uh, Greek. It's a loan word from the Hebrew Old Testament. 28 of the total occurrences are accompanied by the definite article article. Often in the gospel accounts, Jesus is in contact with Satan directly or indirectly. He was tempted by Satan in Mark 1.13 and other places. In the famous Beelzebub controversy, Jesus made clear his intention to drive Satan out of people's lives and to destroy his sovereignty. He liberated a woman whom Satan had kept bound for 18 long years. Paul spoke of his being sent to turn people from the power of Satan to God and that the works of the lawless one were in accordance with the work of Satan in doing sham miracles, signs, and wonders. Christ will come, he wrote, to overthrow that agent of Satan. While the activity of Satan is carried out in the world among those who do not acknowledge Christ as Lord, he also works against the followers of Christ. He influenced Peter's thinking about Jesus to the extent that Jesus said to his disciple, Get behind me, Satan. He asked for all the disciples in order to severely test for them, test them. That's when uh, Jesus told them that Satan wanted to sift them as wheat. He entered into Judas Iscariot, that's possession, 
filled the heart of Ananias. Believers can be tempted by Satan due to a lack of self-control in sexual matters. That's written to us, 1 Corinthians 7, 5. He can even masquerade as an angel of light to accomplish his purposes, 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen. He tormented Paul by means of a thorn in his flesh. Some people even turn away from their faith to follow Satan in 1 Timothy 5, 15. Satan opposes the proclamation of the gospel, snatching away the seed, the word that was sown in people's hearts. He also stopped Paul from traveling to Thessalonica. Satan is regarded in the New Testament as master of death and destruction, who carries out God's wrath against sinners. Twice we read a person's handed over to Satan for spiritual discipline by the church. This appears to mean that excommunication puts people out into Satan's realm, a sovereignty from which he believers have been rescued. And the purpose of that is to bring them back to God's word, believe it or not, to bring them back uh, like the prodigal son to realize they, they need God. They need to get back in that fellowship. In uh, other cases, Satan attacked the disciples of Jesus by sifting them, a figure that is enigmatic. He may have meant to test their faith, with the intent of destroying it, or it may have meant, been, meant to separate off the rubbish. In any case, Satan was up to no good. He was able to enter Judas Iscariot, resulting in that disciple of becoming a betrayer of his master. Peter's sifting may have brought about this threefold denial of Jesus. The nascent church in Jerusalem felt that the brunt of Satan's, he, they felt the brunt of Satan's attacks. He filled Ananias' heart, and he lied to the Holy Spirit, resulting in his sudden demise. The believers in Smyrna felt the sting of persecution. The nations of the earth in John's vision were deceived by him. Jesus spoke of seeing Satan fall like lightning from heaven, a fall not identified but spoken of within the context of demons being cast out, a sign of Satan's loss of authority. In Revelation, amid a war in heaven, Satan was hurled to the earth along with his angels and demons. And it says were, but it will be. He, the accuser, was overcome by one stronger than he, Michael. Finally, he is bound, imprisoned in the abyss for 1,000 years, then ultimately banished in the fiery lake to suffer Eonian torment. Eonian torment. He's released, by the way, for a while for that last final battle at the end of the millennial kingdom. So the other common appellation for Satan in the New Testament is the devil, Diabolos, not found in the Old Testament, but 34 times here, meaning one who is a traducer, a slanderer. The word often translates Satan in the Septuagint, either as the Satan or an adversary. In the New Testament, the devil becomes an evil principle being, principle, an evil being standing against God. In the New Testament, the word appears to be used interchangeably with Satan, Diabolos. Mark refers to Satan five times, but never uses Diabolos, devil. Mar Matthew has three of the former, but six of the latter. So three of uh, Satan and four of the devil. The fourth gospel has one instance of Satan, while the devil, as Satan, occurs twice in the gospel, three times in the epistles. Jesus would drive out the prince of this world by his cross. The later would have no hold on Christ, for he was without sin. And Satan stood condemned at the bar of God's judgment. While the devil has had a career of sinning from the beginning, the Son of God came to destroy his wicked works, 1 John 3, 8. Those unable to hear and receive Jesus' words belong to the devil who is their father, John 8, 44. In other words, they share a family likeness to him. There's no seed involved there. Believers need to exercise care about anger so they are not to give the devil a foothold, Ephesians 4.26. They are to don God's full armor so as to stand against the devil's schemes with a shield or methodologies, his stratagems, actually. With the shield of faith, they are to thwart his flaming arrows, Ephesians 6.11 and 6.16. Ultimate victory comes by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony as the devil is cast. That's talking about Israel in Revelation. So there's a, 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 a little overview of the devil and his work. Interesting, huh? So... Notice that God uses the adversary to advance his purposes by having him stand against his purposes and his people. Since God is in control in the absolute sense, 
How can the adversary truly be God's adversary? He's a tool. That's all he is, a tool. So God created the being called the dragon, the devil, Satan, the serpent, to oppose him so there could be a spiritual conflict of the eons. Through this spiritual conflict, God reveals his great love for humanity, without which it could never be appreciated. Hi, Dave McAuliffe. Good morning to you, too. This adversarial spirit being is not named in the scriptures. Titles describing his character and actions are used instead. I will call him the dragon when speaking of the unveiling and Satan, though, uh, sorry, though it is not a name outside the context of the unveiling, unless it's used uh, as another title like the serpent in Genesis. I'll use the serpent where it uses the serpent. But in general, I'll use Satan so we know who we're talking about. And I'm referring to this dragon. Satan drew a third of God's spirit messengers to himself at some point in the past, perhaps during the first eon. Satan has access to accuse the saints of God, Israel, before God's throne day and night. He and his messengers have not been cast out of heaven yet. The serpent was allowed to enter the Garden of Eden to tempt Eve. He was successful in destroying man's relationship with God, but this was God's plan. Adam was given dominion over all living things on earth, but surrendered it to Satan when he disobeyed God. Thus, Satan usurped the dominion of the earth given to Adam, the son of God. Satan attempted to kill off the seed line to the promised seed related, repeatedly, it should say, since the announcement of it in Genesis 3.15. Let's look at Genesis 3.15. I will put, God says, to the serpent, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall crush your head, you shall crush his heel. This is the primal prophecy of the promised Messiah, the seed of the woman. To crush the head is to withdraw all authority, to destroy authority. To crush the heel refers to the crucifixion of Jesus. The seed of the woman at the moment, at that moment, would not have excluded Eve from being that woman. When Eve birthed her first child, she thought it was the man from the Lord, but it was Cain, the first murderer. What a surprise. And the last thing I want to show you here is this, Satan's attempts to destroy the Messiah. This is a PDF. I'll, I'll put the link of this up, but I'm just going to read this because it's very small, but oh, I can make it bigger. There we go. So this is not a complete list, but I thought it was interesting. So the de Redeemer would be a descendant of Eve. That descendant would, uh, would, let me see, that descendant would at some future time crush the head of the serpent, Satan. So in the plot in 4.8 where Cain kills Abel, that perhaps the first attempt of Satan to, of Satan to frustrate God's plan for the future Redeemer. Abel's sacrifice was accepted. Cain got jealous and killed him. The devil, thinking that Abel might have been the promised seed or the seed line, since he his sacrifice was accepted, so he tries to kill off the seed line right there by killing Abel. God's response was Genesis 2.26, Seth, which means compensation. He gave Eve another child named Seth, which means compensation, to compensate for Abel's death. So that was not the promised seed that the devil thought, but it was the line of the promised seed. It, well, it wasn't because God knew in advance he'd be killed, so he brings up Seth. The Hebrews, the second is the Hebrews going into bondage. Well, there's one not on here, and that's when... Uh, the angels conspired and uh, cohabited with women on the earth somehow and produced the Nephilim. That was the devil's attempt to destroy the whole human race by genetics, just to pollute the whole thing so the Savior couldn't be born. Then we get to Genesis, and what did God do there? The flood. He wiped out the whole generation except for eight people. Next, the Hebrews go into bondage for four generations, and the reason for that is so the devil could try to wipe out the chosen people again. God's response four general, generations later was Moses. In Exodus, Exodus 122, Pharaoh, fearing the number of Jews being born, orders all the baby boy, boys thrown into the river. 
So if there's no Moses, there's no promised land, no Messiah, Judea is also spared the tribe of Jesus. So that would wipe out the seed line. So Exodus 2.3, God's response, Moses is hidden by his mother in a reed and down the river, remember? And the daughter of Pharaoh finds and raises his Moses. <laughs> what, what a God we have. In Numbers 20, there's, there's more on here. I'm not going to read them all. I'm going to give you the link to it. In fact, I'll put it in the video description right now. And, you know, you could do your own list, uh, augment this one if you want. So let me paste this in the chat, the live chat. And we'll move on here. So we've covered chapter 12. It introduced the spiritual war that's going on. And God's not at war. This is all in the air and on the earth. Uh, you know, devil is the prince of the power of the air. He will be kicked out of heaven. He's not out of heaven now. He still has access to the throne of God. He's not accusing us in the church because we nobody can bring a charge against us. Isn't that something? But the reason for all the judgments in the unveiling is because of uh, it's for the purpose of God revealing himself and his righteousness to man who walked away from him in the garden. So Wednesday night, I want to get to that walking away and see exactly what happened there. So your word work is to read chapter 12, the unveiling of Jesus Christ again. You can use any version you want, but at least read one once the concordant literal version contained in this presentation. Review the notes in this presentation and read chapters 3 and 7 of Daniel to prepare for next week's session. That's what we're going to do. So on Wednesday evening, we'll look at the beginning of Satan's conflict with mankind by examining the fall of man, as they call it, in details, in much detail. If you think you know about that one, and you might, I bet you're going to learn something else if you come Wednesday night. Next Saturday, we'll, be, we'll continue with chapter 13 of the unveiling. That's with the beast that rises out of the earth, or out of the sea and the earth, the two beasts. So I'll see you in session 13 Wednesday and 14 on Saturday morning. Remember, we're doing Wednesday on this uh, unveiling series. It'll be session 13. So... Do we have any questions or comments here? Kevin, Joshua, D. By the way, I've been having, I think, spiritual attack here because my main computer went out Saturday, a hard drive failure, and um, other stuff happened trying to put it back together. But then a few days later on Wednesday, my laptop went out and another uh, disk failure, but this was just doing a Windows update. It failed in the middle, and I could no longer get it up. So I am on my third, my work laptop, the one I use for development here. Praise God, I had one. So uh, I'm not that bummed out. All the data has been backed up to the cloud before the, the computers crash. But So this is why I'm not having my normal format here. But anyway... We're getting through it with God's help. Praise God. Nothing can stop God's word. Nothing can stop it. <laughs> okay. So. So again, thank you for joining me. I hope you're getting ready for the holiday season here. It's uh, upon us. And whatever your views of that is. Um. I believe Jesus Christ was born September 11th, 3 BC, not December 25th. But I see nothing wrong with celebrating his birth if that's what you're doing, instead of all the, you know, celebrating commercialism. You know, people gave him gifts. They didn't give gifts to each other when he was born. They gave him gifts. But now we've changed that into everybody giving each other gifts and celebrating uh, the solstice, basically. That's what how Christmas started out. Will you get to what you think the empire of steel is, Joshua? Yes, I will.
That's going to be next week, as a matter of fact, Saturday, though, not Wednesday, Saturday, because we're going to go through those seven heads and ten horns. Uh, yeah. So we'll get to that empire of steel. It's not Rome. Sounds like the adversary is not happy with you teaching this good stuff. Yeah. <laughs> he likes to sideline us, quiet us, you know, ruin the witness. But, you know, I didn't. I rejoiced when that happened because everything was backed up and I know God's got a solution. So never bum out when things happen. Just, you know, it just amuses me what the devil does to try to stop God and his people because, you know, he might succeed here and there, but in the end, he's getting cast out of heaven to the earth. He's, he's going to be mopped up, mopped up. <laughs> So England is playing in the World Cup this afternoon. My wife's British. She's all excited about that. We're going to see how they do. I think they're going to win. I think they're going to beat France, which is a very good team in uh, soccer that they call football. But I'm going to let you all go now. Thank you for joining me and being patient with me through all the trials and tribulations we're going through here with technology. <laughs> I'll see you Wednesday night. We'll talk about Genesis chapter 3. God bless you in Jesus' name.